In this video, I'm going to show you some basics of using MySQL Workbench to create a table, as well as how to run some simple queries to insert records. For this demo, I'm assuming that you have um, MySQL Workbench installed. You can get to your database by simply clicking on this connection. The first time into Workbench, you may end up with a screen looking like this um, with several panels open that aren't needed at this point. Um, you can control hiding and showing the panels. If you look in the upper right, there are icons that let you hide the right panel. We don't need that. And also on the left, we don't need this management section, but we do need to see the schemas. So go ahead and click on that and that will show you your database schema. Your schema may or may not be expanded with the triangle on the side. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, open that up and notice it has a few different options, including tables, and I'm gonna open that up as well. I have some tables created already. So a one database can contain many tables inside of it. So I'm going to be demonstrating how to make a new table and I'm going to call it users. So before we get into that, let's look a little bit at a couple of things you'll need to know about tables. There are some naming rules when we make a table and also um, fields inside that table. For it, we can only use letters, numbers, and underscore, so no spaces. And it shouldn't be the same as an existing keyword. It can't be longer than 64 characters, which I should hope you wouldn't make it that long because that'd be just a typing nightmare. And also, when you're naming, it needs to be unique within its realm. So what I mean by that is no two fields of the same table could be the name the same or no two tables within the same database could be named the same. So let's go ahead and create a table. To do that, I'm going to just go ahead and right click on the word tables and create table. And it brings up a panel that lets it set some things up. Now Workbench is really just a tool that will write SQL statements for us to more easily create tables. It's just a, a graphic user interface for that. So if you notice up here, um, it says table name. So I'm going to just do a basic name. I'm going to be making a table that will hold a person's name, their email, and their password. So I'm just going to go ahead and call it users. Now a lot of these things I'm just going to leave as the default and that will be just fine. And the first thing we need to do when we make a table is give it a primary key, which is required. Double click here and notice it automatically comes up with one. Um, it's calling itself ID users. I'm going to change that to user ID and it gave itself a data type of integer, which is pretty typical. Notice it's got primary key checked, not null checked. Now let's jump over and look at some of the things we need to think about with a primary key. Okay, a primary key is needed to keep track of records in a table. So every table will require this. A primary key must always have a value and that value must never change once it's assigned. And it also needs to be unique for each record in the table. So it's often listed as ID or user ID. Um, and today I'm just doing one called user ID. Often it's of type integer and set to auto increment to easily ensure that it is unique. So back to this, if you notice we have our integer, I'm calling mine user ID. I'm just making it all one word. Like I pointed out, it's already marked as a primary key and not null, so it has to have a value. And to make things easy, I'm going to check this AI, which will make it auto increment. So each time I insert a record, I don't actually have to even think about making a number for the user ID. And I also don't have to keep track of what the next number should be. It'll automatically do that for me. To make another column, because I want to have um, the user's name, their email, and then also a password, I just double click there and it automatically just comes up with a default. In this case, it says users call column, right? So I'm going to um, call my first one name. 
And then we've got data types. So let's look at possible data types. Okay, so I just want to talk about a few basic field data types. There's a whole mess of them, but these are just some common ones. One of them is character, and then in square brackets you can indicate the length. So that's a fixed length field from 0 to 255 characters long. And so that would be really handy if you have something that's absolutely a certain number of characters. For instance, an abbreviation of a state, which would have two characters. Another option is variable character. It looks like varchar and also length. And so that's a variable length field from 0 to 65,535 characters. Now that one, we'll talk about in a second the difference between character and variable character. This one only holds the amount of data that it needs to hold. So once again, we'll talk about that in a second. Integer would hold an integer, int. Float would hold a small number with a floating decimal point. And then text is a string with a maximum length of 65,535 characters. So that's great if you're um, storing descriptions of things. Now when you're choosing this, the size of any field should be restricted to the smallest possible value based on the largest possible input. So for instance, back to the character, if I'm storing the state, I know that it's really only going to be two characters. Or let's say I was going to be storing somebody's last name, I would come up with an idea of how long a last name could possibly be and make that the maximum and allow it to store that, but I wouldn't want to make my field, for instance, 255 characters because it's unlikely that somebody would have a, a last name with that long. So pretty much you just want to think about how much information you're storing because it's really going to be taking up space memory-wise. Let's look at character versus variable character, the difference really. So character, let's say I had character 10. This would hold 10 characters regardless of the data it holds. And I could do the same thing with variable character 10, but that would hold up to 10 characters and it'll shrink to fit the data. So here's an example of that. Let's say I wanted to store Ted. With character, I would have 10 spots where each character could go. And let's say I store Ted, but even though it's only needing three, it will store all 10 in memory. So it's using 10 spots. With variable character, it gives me up to 10 spots. So if I store Ted, then it'll store it, but it won't store those empty spaces. So it does reduce your file size. I personally tend to use variable character more than character. So back to the table, I've got name, and if I have a name, I have variable character, let's make this, let's say it's their full name or, or uh, maybe even just a first name. I have 45, let's say, um, let's say 75. I don't think a name's going to be longer than that. So it's going to shrink to the needed size, so that should still be fine. Now I don't want to check primary key because that, I only have one primary key. I'm not going to say not null because if it's null, I don't want to um, crash this and um, the rest I'm just going to leave alone. So I also want email and I would think about how long an email would be. That same sort of thing. I could say I can't imagine it being more than 75 characters. And then I'm just double clicked there. I'm going to do one for password. I'm just going to say pass and same sort of thing. Just to be safe, I'm going to make it a little large. Now let's just make it 50. I can't imagine it longer than that either. Now I do want to mention in this example, I am storing just plain text as the password, which is a terrible idea if it's really a password. In a different video, I'm going to show how to take in values and encrypt it, but um, this is really just demonstrating how you can store things. The reason I'm sticking with this is that um, in a later video, I'm also going to show how to allow for changes. So let's say I wanted to change my password. I could check for an old password and I could change it into a new one. So once again, if you're doing this, we're not actually, it's not a great idea to store text as a regular password. Okay, so now that these are all in place, 
I need to hit this apply button down here for this to work. My SQL Workbench is really just a tool to write SQL statements to create and manipulate the database. So when I hit apply, it will then write the SQL statement that goes along with this. So notice it's actually writing the SQL for create table and it's defining user ID, name, email, and pass. And it identifies the primary key. So what's nice about this is that I don't have to type this out. Now I have to click one more button. I'm clicking apply and I'm looking for that check mark to see that it worked and finish. Now when I'm back over here, um, I can see my users table is there and if I want to see inside of it, I'm going to right click and I'm going to say select rows limit 1000. Before I do that, um, my SQL Workbench tends to keep all of these panels open all the time. So I'm going to go ahead and close that because we're done building our table. So here I am, I'm going to go to users, right click, select rows limit 1000. So if you notice, I don't have any data in there yet, but it has columns for user ID, name, email, and pass, and I can stretch that larger to contain information. So now I want to show you how you can use SQL to insert information into your table. So right here, there is an SQL panel already there for us to type in and run. So right now, it has select all from my table users, and this is the name of my database. So what I'm going to do is instead use an insert statement. For that, I am going to pull up um, some information from the W3Schools website. I think it's a great resource. And notice I've got my insert statement here, just as an example. And this is the format. What you're going to be doing is typing insert into the name of your table. You will list the columns that you want to insert into. Then you'll say the word values and then write the values you would like to insert. So over here, I'm just going to type that up, insert into, and in this case, I'm going to define the name of the database and then the name of the table just to make sure it knows where to go. So the name of the table is users. Depending on the setup, you may not require the name of the database as well. So then I list my three columns or however many columns. Since user ID is auto increment, I don't need to even bother with that one. So I need name, email, and pass. And those do not need to be in quotes. Then I type the word values, and then I put the values I would like to be inserted in there, in quotes. Let's say it's Ken. Ken at Gmail. And his password is pizza. Once again, this is not how you would actually store passwords. I'm just using it as an example of how to write to a database. So like I also said later on, I'll show how to do encryption, but this is just a plain text example so you can make sure things are getting in there for practice. So now that I have this, I would need to get it into the database by running the query. So I can do that by using this lightning bolt and it will execute that statement. You can see in the bottom panel that it ran, insert into Retzer S, users, name, email, pass, values, can, and, and so on. And there's a little green check mark, so I'm assuming it worked fine. If we want to see it, we need to then right click on users, select rows limit 1000, and notice it's there. It automatically put that integer in for the user ID, we have ken, ken at gmail.com, pizza. Now, if I want to do other inserts, I can just go back to the tab that I used before and just change the values because this is all set up. Um, so I could have Mary. Let's do Mary at Gmail. 
and she's got cats can run that let me just do a couple of them here I'm gonna fill a few of these in just so we have some things in the database okay so I inserted two others let's check that again I can go to users here and right click select lowest limit 1000 and notice once again it's making an SQL statement to display this and that is select all from my table users and it shows me what's inside of there now what's nice about workbench is if you didn't want to go the SQL way you can actually edit directly inside of your table so I could go in here I'm gonna skip this user ID but I can just type directly in and that's kind of nice okay the thing with this is when I'm typing this isn't actually making a change to my table right now I need to apply that change because this workbench is only making the SQL statements to run for me so if I were to close this and not save it this will not be here so I need to click on the supply button and notice it made that insert statement for me insert into and it's got the values and then I hit apply it executed and then I hit finish so now it's part of that if I want to go back and verify I can just simply right click on users select rows and it shows me the items in my table the other thing to keep in mind is while I'm working on this this is actually editing the database on the server so when I'm done and I want to close this I don't need to save a file to my machine or do anything specific this is directly editing the database I connected to